Ephesians 3.20, it says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond anything we ask or anything we imagine. I believe that God has a beyond for you. I don't believe that you're here by chance. I believe that God has a purpose for you, a beyond for you. I don't know what that beyond quite is. Maybe it's a job. Maybe you're single and you want to get married. Any singles in the house? Let's get these single people married. Come on. Lift up your hand. Check out your options right here, right now. But God has a beyond for you. And so we're believing, and this whole series is, is, is a faith adventure. This, this church thing, this God thing, it, it's a faith element. We have to step out in faith. We don't have, always have it all figured out, but it is a faith journey. It is a faith element. Where are you stepping out in faith? And so we're praying for you. We're believing that God wants to take you beyond, beyond in your marriage, beyond where you work, beyond to reach. Maybe your beyond is to reach someone that you love and invite them to this Christmas season. And so we're believing for all of those good things. God came to Abraham and gave him a promise. And in Galatians, we actually find out that the same promises that were for Abraham are also promises for us. And this one specific thing that God said to Abraham in Genesis 12 too, he said, Abraham, I'm going to bless you and you're going to be a blessing to others. How many of you believe that? Like God's going to bless you, but you're also going to be a blessing to others. Why don't you take a moment, turn to the person next to you and say, you're going to be a blessing to others. God's going to use you to be a blessing to someone else. God, God wants that for our lives. He, he loves to bless us. We're his children. I love as a father to bless my kids, all five of them. There's blessings going out everywhere all the time. I love to bless my kids. But also, it is so rewarding to see my kids bless somebody else. And so God came to him. And I believe that that, that promise is true for us today. And so we're going to actually fast forward, though, 2,000 years after Abraham to after Jesus, when the church had started, a guy by the name of Paul. Paul wasn't serving God. God showed up in his life and dramatically changed his life. I'm standing here today because many, many years ago, there was a moment with God that changed the entire course of my life. And so I don't know what you came in here today with. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know what doubts you have. I don't know what concerns. I don't know what worries you brought into church this weekend. But a moment with God can change the entire course of your life. And so our hearts are open. Our hearts are ready. We believe this. And so this is what Paul came and he wrote to a church. And whenever someone's writing to a church in the Bible, I think we can learn about it because we're a church. We're the church. It's not the building. It's the people of God. And this is what Paul said to this church in Corinth. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. He said, now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters... Dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. That's pretty cool. He says, they're being tested by many troubles, and they, were very, and they are very poor. But they also are filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. So they're struggling. They have such poverty, yet they're overflowing with generosity. Have you seen some people before who don't look like they have a lot, but they're really happy with what God has given them. I've been to orphanages that have nothing, and then I've realized, but they're still happy. They have a joy that only comes from God. Paul goes on to say, for I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more, and they did it of their own free will. One translation says, they gave as much as they were able and beyond their ability. He says, they begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem, and they even did more than we had hoped. And so we pick up this, this text, and Paul is writing to this church. He's saying, hey, the Corinthian church, I want you to be a part of giving to advancing the cause of Christ. I want you to be a part of giving to the church in Jerusalem. And he says, hey, let me tell you about the Macedonians. Let me tell you about them. They were in such poverty. They were so poor. They didn't have a lot. I was actually going to even pass them by. You ever like see someone, if you're picking someone on your, for a sports team in junior high, and you're like, no, I'm not picking them. We're just going to pass by them. Maybe you were that person. I'm sorry if you were. But Paul is writing to this church, and he's saying, hey, Macedonia, they're so poor. They've gone through such a difficult time. We're not even going to ask them to give. But then Paul says to the Corinthian church, hey, they begged me. They said, no, we want to be in on this. We want to be in on helping churches. We want to be in on helping the cause of Christ. And it says in that text, because they would, they could. Because they would, 
they could. They said, we want to be in on this. And I find it interesting how many things in life, if we would, we could. Like for me, there's some things I don't do. I don't do mayo. Like Clark Kent has kryptonite, I have mayo. And it, I'm serious, from a childhood experience, I was in first grade. Our babysitter left out bologna sandwiches in the 100 plus degree weather of the Illinois sun beating down on that bologna sandwich. There was mayo on it. I came back, took one bite of the mayo. I died. Jesus brought me back to life. <laughs> that's, that's what I remember. I don't, can't remember all the details. but So I don't do mayo. I also don't do cats. I don't hang around cats. We're not homies. If you have a cat, I want to tell you, if someone breaks into your house, that cat will point their little paw and say, they're in the back room. <laughs> if you have a dog, that dog will fight for you. But there is one more thing I don't do. I don't do heights. Anybody else? Show me some love. Come on, participation. Show me some love. Thank you. Thank you. Let's have a counseling therapy session right here, right now. There have been times where Daniel and I have gone on vacation. We've gotten a getaway. And they have upgraded our room to a room that we could not afford. Like, they put us up on the 19th floor when there's only 20 floors. And I've said, excuse me, I'm sorry, what room did you say again? The 19th floor. I'm like, yeah, we don't want that. I've watched their faces go, what? You, you, sir, you're staying on, like, the fourth floor? The 19th floor is, like, the best room besides the best room? I'm like, yeah, I don't do, I don't do heights. My wife just stood there and shook her head and said, and then I've, I've literally asked them, has anyone ever done this before? When you've given them something free, said, nope, I don't want that. I want to go lower. They said, no, never. And I'm like, well, I'm the first because I don't do heights. I don't do heights because I, I get anxious and I don't, I don't want to fall on my face. And I, if I fall off four stories, I might survive. But if I fall out of 19 stories, I ain't coming back to preach. So there's some things I don't do. I just... I don't do heights. I was with some pastors in Texas, and I had the opportunity to do a zip line, but I don't do heights. However, it is amazing what peer pressure can do, <laughs> because when you have older friends than you, and they're like, man, we're doing the zip line. I'm like, I don't want to do the zip line. And so I snapped some photos of my friends, pastors that maybe you know, Pastor Tim and Lonnie, some from some great churches. Here we are. Tim was really, really excited to do this. Lonnie was as well. And then I snapped one photo just, I wanted it to be on my phone in case this was the last photo I ever took. <laughs> this one right here. <laughs> and this is the zip line. It, I mean, it looks much worse than this picture, but it's three, four stories high. It's over this lake. I asked the guy, is there alligators in this thing? If you've, has anyone ever fallen and lived before? I'm asking him all of these questions. I'm, I'm getting the help that I need because I don't do heights. But again, it's amazing what peer pressure does to you. It's amazing what, if you'll listen to other people from time to time, get some help, they can help you out. And so I decided to go on this zip line. Would you like to see how I did? You're going to have to show me a lot more love than that. Would you? Here we go. Brian Sanders next on deck. I think he's going full sail. He's ready to exit. Let's go. Here we go. <laughs> Here he comes, right at me. Come on, wave, man. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. Did you hear him on that? Did you hear him? He was like, wave. I'm like, I'm not waving. I'm not dying one hand going. I'm going down. I'll never see my children again. I was like this. And then when I got done, I was like, wow, that was actually fun. What would I have missed out on if I wouldn't have gone on this zip line besides the humor and the funny pictures for people to make fun of me on? What would I have missed out on? Just a moment. I wonder how many of us miss out on things because we've already set ourselves up We've already, said, we've already set ourselves up and said, yeah, we can't do that. We won't do that. See, because we're in the Beyond series, and everybody wants God to do something above and beyond in their lives. 
I believe that. How many of you want God to do? This would be a great time to just say, God, one, I'll give you one, at least one clap. God, I want you to do something in my life. Everybody wants God to do something in their life beyond outside of the box of the God that you know. Because if God can do everything that you can think of and everything that you can imagine, then the God you're following is, is, is not the God of the Bible. Because the God of the Bible says, I can do above and beyond. Anything you can think. Single, that's right, you're single, you're ready to mingle. God can give you that godly husband, that godly wife, someone greater than you could ever even imagine. That job, that dream, that, that desire to help people in whatever career path you take, God could do something in your life beyond what you could actually think or imagine. Yet, reality is, some of us, just like what I do with my kids' devices, we put restrictions on. I have kids. There's certain things they can listen to, they can't listen to. They put restriction, we put restrictions on them so we can help guard our kids' hearts. Yet I sometimes think there are things that you, you and I have done. We've restricted God before we'd e we've even let God act. We put a restriction on God. We've said, God, I don't do heights. What are those things that God has asked you to do that you've already said, God, I don't do that, but God, I'll show up to church. God, I'll take some notes. God, I'll even, man, I'll even worship a little bit. But God, there's one thing I don't do. God, I, I don't give. Maybe that's your heights. God, I, I, don't, I don't give. That's the one thing. I don't do that. And some of us have already restricted what God can do in our life. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, he said, the way in which you give will be a measure of how it's given back to you. So if you ever wonder, man, it seems like no one, my life's not as blessed, but Jesus said the way you give will determine what's given back to you. Some of us have already restricted God from doing above and beyond things in our lives because God doesn't just want to do above and beyond things for your salvation. He's already done that. Jesus on the cross, he came back to life for you. He's already saved your soul. But he wants to do beyond in your finances, beyond in your home life, beyond with your kids, beyond in your dreams, in your future. Yet some of us, we've, we've already put the restrictions on it. We've said, God, that zip line of giving, I don't do that. And Paul was challenging the church in Corinth to say, there's a church that they thought that maybe they, all of us would say they had restrictions. They were poor. There was a political climate that was corrupt. Maybe there had been some earthquakes, a lot of poverty, not a good environment. And Paul even put a restriction on them and said, hey, man, I didn't think that they could give. But they said, no, we, we want to give to the cause of Christ. We want to give to something that makes a difference. And I believe that you're here because at the end of your life, you want to do something that makes a difference, that makes an eternal difference, that when you die, it actually lives on. When you die, you'll actually see the results of what you did here on earth. And when you serve God's church, when you give to God's church, when you invite people to the house, when you share the gospel, those are things that will last forever. And so church, we have to ask ourselves, have we taken on the mentality I don't do that. Because if we have that mentality when it comes to giving, we're going to miss out on the above and beyond that God wants to do in our lives. So for our generosity, when it comes to it, what is a couple things that maybe Paul would want us to download? Well, number one, there will always, always be walls. Walls will always be in the way. I would like to give, but Brian, I just can't give. Remember the church in Macedonia? They were poor. They, they didn't have a lot to give. There was a wall in their way. I get it. There's a wall in your way. Hey, there's walls in my ways. I just found out that three of my kids need braces. Thank you for not clapping. I appreciate that. Because I, I, I think I'm going to get on YouTube and figure out how to do this myself. <laughs> Some of those YouTube videos, they can teach you a lot of stuff. Don't move, this is gonna be painful. <laughs> Dad, I don't think you're doing it right. Trust me, I'm your father, I love you. <laughs> You'll be fine, what's one crooked tooth? 
But there's always going to be walls that will say, I mean, you just can't give. You live paycheck to paycheck. 70% of people do that. They live paycheck to paycheck. They struggle. They're financially, they're, they're like, I love God, but I, I can't do that. And if you have that mindset, you've already put a restriction on God. Because are you the provider for what you have, or is God the provider for what you have? Hey, let me help you out. Everything you have is God's. Whether you realize it or not, God actually owns you. Your body is a temple. If you're a believer, you were bought with the price. He paid for you. He loves you. God owns everything. The question is, do we trust him to do his way or our way? Because some people do things their own way. And let me just go on a little sidebar. I love you. How's that working for you? 70% of people live paycheck to paycheck. They struggle. They worry. They stress about finances. They love God. But they, with the money thing, I don't do heights. And then they wonder, why all this frustration? Well, why, why, why all this arguing about money in your marriage? Arguing about money with your kids? If we have any parents, you've ever argued about money with your kids, just confess in church. I know that I have, because last time I checked, I'm giving them the money. God's doing the same with us. He's giving us this. Do we trust him to go his way or to go our own way? The second thing I want you to know is if you would, you could. If you would, you could. That church who didn't have anything, it says that they gave what they could, and then even beyond their ability. But it says that they would, they would give. They would give God a shot, and God would do something above and beyond. They didn't have a lot, but it's interesting how God takes what little we have, and he multiplies it. Remember the feeding of the 5,000? It was probably the feeding of the several thousands, because there's more people there not just men, and that little boy had the, that bread and that fish and the disciples, he gave it to them, or what, what histor- history doesn't tell you is that maybe Peter beat him up and took the lunch anyways. I don't know if you'll find that in a commentary. Sometimes I might think Peter was like, hey, you're going to give me that lunch, aren't you? The kid was like, no, because if the kid was in junior high, there's no way that kid was sharing that lunch. <laughs> and if he was younger than junior high, you know for sure he wasn't going to share that lunch. Have you ever got fries for your kids at McDonald's and said, can I have a few of those fries when they're like five years old? They won't share Jack with you. And then that's when you're like, hey, I can stop the car, take all of those fries, including the ones in your mouth, and eat them all. And then they go, okay, I'll share. And they give you one and it's like an ant couldn't eat that thing because it's so tiny. But they didn't have a lot. But they were willing to give. If you would, you could. The church in in Macedonia, they would. They were willing. Just like that that fish and that bread, God multiplied it. And the disciples were like, oh, we just got, this is all we have. And Jesus is like, hey, start giving it out. So they gave it to these disciples. You know, they're handing out. And then they're like, wait a second. How much bread and fish did that kid give us? I don't know. Just keep feeding it out, Peter. Bartholomew, just keep feeding it out. You're always complaining about something. And then, they just kept, and then they're like, whoa, we just fed thousands of people with this little that we had. God is very good at taking your would and making it to a could. Taking it and making it above and beyond. That's what God does in the church. He takes everybody's little portion and he multiplies it. And I don't know how God does it, but I've watched this happen year after year. God has an unbelievable way at going above and beyond, especially when he knows reaching people. You could if you would. You would if you could. This summer, we taught our five-year-old to finally ride a bike. We got a little behind on that. Please don't judge us as parents. And we took him to this church parking lot, and Danielle was pushing him around, and he would go a little bit, you know, and then catch himself, and go a little bit, and then catch himself, and we're like, Luke, if you, you know, we're thinking, if you just would, you could ride that bike, if you would just, don't put your foot down, just, if you would, just keep going, if you would, just keep pedaling, 
then you could ride that bike up and down the street. And so this is what Luke did, eventually. There he is. He just kept going, and the funniest thing about that is this is all he did for about 15 minutes, just around in a circle, around us, over and over and over and over again. But it all started if he would try to ride that bike, and then he could ride down the street. And that's a miracle because Daniel and I could just hang out, take naps, and he would just go up and down the street. He had a bike to ride, but it all started because he would make the decision that he could eventually go up and down the street. It's the same with our generosity. It's the same with our giving. If we would say, God, I'm going to trust you with my giving. I know there are people in here. One time you did trust God with your giving. And just along the way, you just stopped and you're like, okay, God, I'm not being blessed anymore. But that's not how God works. God says, if you trust me, the same measure you give will be given back to you. Paul was showing up to that church and writing that letter over the years, and he said, Hey, would you give for the church in Jerusalem? He was challenging for another church of people who could hear the gospel, who could share the gospel. And guys, that's what we're about. As we've stepped into our beyond, we're willing to give because we want to see what God can do. We want to see God change lives. See, if you're not giving, you should because eternity matters. There's always a cost to reach the lost. See, the Beyond campaign for us as a church is to reach beyond, to build beyond, and to care beyond. To reach beyond means that in a few years, we're going to start another campus, another Elevate Church in the surrounding areas. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that going to be amazing? So we're going to start a second campus. We've looked at where everyone comes from, and we've said, there are people who come here, and what is the gospel? The gospel is always about God going somewhere. All throughout the pages of Scripture, God's like, go. God's like, go. To build beyond is that we would take care of this facility, is that we update our technology in here, update our e-kids facilities, yet then also pay off this facility. Most of the people who attend our church now were not even here many years ago when we did the outside of this building, and I've heard over and over again, hey, how did you get here? I drove by this church. And there's like this blue building, a spaceship in the middle of a neighborhood. And so I just came. And they'll say this statement. I came, I never left. And we're thankful that you came. And we're thankful that you never left. But many people before you, they were blessed. And so they said, I want to be a blessing to others. And they gave back. And now is our opportunity as a church to be a blessing for others. Do you know in a church that if we had this facility paid off, that we would be able to launch campuses or start other churches with other people every two years if this was paid off? The opportunities of what God could do if we would so that we could. The last thing is the care beyond. Our orphanage in Haiti, we've asked them, what do you need from us? They said, we need a teaching facility. So we're going to help them get a teaching facility at that orphanage in La Semance. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be awesome. This is a God-sized goal above and beyond our regular tithes and offerings. And it will take sacrifice to reach this goal. It will take a challenge for a church to be united and say, you know what? I care about reaching people. I care about taking care of this place. I care about taking care of the poor because that's the heartbeat of God. And this is Elevate Church, not Average Church. If there is a name named Average Church, hey, we wish you average. But we want God's beyond for our church. And so it's going to take all of us to do a couple of things. I want to challenge you to consider praying about being a part of Beyond coming up. I'm going to ask you to do three things. We're going to challenge you to commit to pray and then to participate. Hey, if this is your church, man, I need you here. I need you to pray about participating and what God would have you give. Ultimately, you're going to have the opportunity to pick a number. I mean, you can save on coffee. You can sell something you don't even use anymore. I'm convinced that a lot of these resources are sitting in our homes that we don't even use anymore. But you've got to pick a number. You've got to say, God, I want to give beyond 
to make the church advance beyond. But you can pick your number, and I'm a numbers guy. Like, I, I love numbers. Like, Rain Man, I can add them up really fast, and then I'm like, oh, yeah, 20% of that. And you get these numbers. But then there's the faith number. There's God's number. And so I would challenge you to pray about what would God's number be for you to be in this so that years from now you'll look back and go, and I was a part of beyond. And when we're standing in that next campus and someone says, I came the year you started this church. My life has been changed. My family's life has been changed. I've been saved in this church. The entire course of my life has changed because you showed up here. We're going to be able to look back and go, I was a part of changing someone's eternal reservation. I would wonder, are you one of those, pe those people who are just like, Brian, I love it here, but I don't do heights. I don't do that giving thing. And I would ask you this one simple question. What is it that you've convinced yourself that you can't do but really, you won't do. What is it that you've convinced yourself when it comes to your giving that not that you can't do, but you won't do? Because the church in Macedonia, because they would, they could. I'm telling you, church, if you would, God could and God can do above and beyond anything we can imagine. It will take all of us. It will not be equal gifts. It will be equal sacrifice. It will be about giving something back to someone you love so much more. I do think a lot of people are going to get to the end of their life and they're going to look back and say, I could have done more to advance the cause of Christ because none of us are taking our stuff with us. It's not wrong to have nice things. It's not wrong that you've been blessed. Hey, God says, I'll bless you. Church, I'm telling you, I've been blessed. And a lot of the things I've been blessed with, money cannot buy. I've been blessed. But I know that I've been blessed to be a blessing. I want to take my one and only life and spend the rest of my life reaching beyond, building beyond, and carrying beyond. And God's just waiting. God is waiting for a church that is serious about the mission and the plan of God. Like he's waiting, he's, he's tapping on your heart. Like, are you gonna be in on this? Or is your response to God gonna be, God, I don't do heights. I think some of us, there are things that we've convinced ourselves we can't do, but in reality, we won't do. But if you would do, God will do above and beyond. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I know that there are people sitting here today, they've been saved because of the work you've done in this church, because of your son Jesus, you've done the work here, and we've been able to be a part of it. For some, they've found their spouse, the love of their life. For some in here, they've found their best friends. For some, they've felt welcomed, they've felt loved, they've felt encouraged. When they look back at their life, they know that there's something special about the house of God. It's the place where the people of God gather in the presence of God. They hear the plan of God and then they go out and share his purposes around the world. God, I pray that they would remember the great cost that you so generously did for us. You gave your only son, Jesus. His body was beaten for us his blood was shed for us. God, let that be our motivation to remember what Jesus has done for us and all the good things that he's blessed us with, that we would be a blessing to others, that God, this church has went beyond to reach them. Now they're challenged to leave their comfort and be a blessing to others. I don't even have a relationship with God. Hey, I want to give you the opportunity to receive Jesus as your personal savior. God loves you so much. He died for you. He has a plan for your life. And you can chase possessions. You can chase being with the right people. You can chase pleasure. You can chase a bunch of stuff that will never truly satisfy. 
only Jesus will really satisfy. I want to give you the opportunity to be made right with God because our sin, our mistakes separate us from him. But 2,000 years ago, he died on a cross for you and for me, and he loves you. He wants a relationship with you today. I'm going to pray a simple prayer. If you need to make this your prayer, maybe you've wandered away from him and you need to make a decision to turn back and follow him. Hey, let this be your moment that will change the entire course of your life. Hey, pray with me right where you're sitting. Just say, Heavenly Father, thank you for your son Jesus. I thank you that he died on a cross for me, that he gave his life for me. Today I receive him as my personal savior. I want all the blessings that he has for my life. I want him to lead my life. I want him to fill me with his Holy Spirit, guide me in all my decisions. Today I'm choosing Jesus. Today I'm choosing eternal life, salvation. I'm choosing the best life that God has for me. God, I'm praying that today. I receive your free gift of your son. God, forgive me. Give me a brand new start today, Lord. Today is the first day of the rest of my life. God sees you. He knows you right where you are. He knows what you're facing. You just tell him, God, today I'm choosing you. Today I receive salvation. And with all of heaven, all of heaven is celebrating our church. We welcome you into God's family, and we're celebrating with you. Come on, church, let's put our hands together. Come on, let's welcome them.